tonight, an abortion repeal failure. There are so many people who are watching right now and watching what Arizona is doing. The failed vote in the Arizona legislature leaving the 1864 abortion ban law intact despite a swell of support to remove it from the state's books after the Supreme Court in Arizona voted to keep the status quo as is. So what happens next and what about a potential November ballot measure? We're there with the details. Plus. A trail of destruction, more than a dozen tornadoes ripping through four states as the severe weather threatens millions. We'll have the details on the destruction and the potential path ahead. And so when the police come through and they do a sweep of this area, what do they do? What do they tell you? If you don't comply, you are trespassed and you could possibly go to jail. As states take measures to criminalize homeless encampments all across the country, the question now being asked, is it legal? In tonight's Prime Focus, ABC's Devin Dwyer heads to Oregon and takes a look at the conditions of those unhoused and the measures now being used to remove them. And good evening, I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are going to begin tonight with the key swing state of Arizona moving to keep that Civil War era abortion ban on the books ahead of the November election. Despite urging from former President Trump, State House Republicans today voted down an effort to repeal the state's 1864 law banning abortion. The move by Arizona's Supreme Court last week to uphold the ban set off a political firestorm across the country. Country. The leading Republican Senate candidate there, Kerry Lake, came out against the ban. Vice President Kamala Harris traveled to the state in recent days to campaign there. Ultimately, voters may have the final say as Arizona is one of 14 states where abortion could be on the ballot this November. We are standing by to hear from an Arizona state Republican representative. But first, we begin with Elizabeth Schulze on the ground in Arizona. Tonight, Arizona Republican lawmakers refusing to repeal one of the toughest abortion laws in the country, a law written during the Civil War more than 160 years ago, banning abortion in all cases except to save the life of the mother. The last thing we should be doing today is rushing a bill through the legislative process. Democrats outraged. We're talking about a bill that was passed before Arizona was even a state, before women had the right to vote. But Republican lawmakers tonight defending the law. We have the best law possible on the books right now. The 1864 law is the best law yes. possible. Yes. A law that is makes abortion impossible for women in every circumstance except for to save a mother's life. Arizona is a pro-life state. And that law was put into place by people that believe in the sanctity of life. Arizona, one of 21 states to ban or severely restrict abortion since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Donald Trump has boasted of nominating three of the five justices who overturned Roe. We broke Roe v. Wade and we did something that nobody thought was possible. We gave it back to the states, and the states are working very brilliantly. Still, Trump says Arizona went too far. He knows that voters will likely have the last word on the matter. Arizona, one of 14 states where abortion could be on the ballot this fall. Abortion rights has won wherever it's gone before voters, including in conservative states like Kansas, Kentucky, and Ohio. Today, Republican lawmakers told me they're not worried. Voters are smart. They would rather vote for somebody that they respect and disagree with than somebody who doesn't believe in anything. Elizabeth joins us now. Uh, Elizabeth, Arizona is a key battleground state. We know that. But it's not just the candidates on the upcoming ballot. That's right, Phil. As we say, 14 states at least are expected to include abortion measures on the ballot, meaning it will be up to voters to decide where they stand on this issue. When it's been on the ballot in the past, it drives up turnout. And in every instance, the abortion rights position has won. Phil. All right. Elizabeth Schulze from Phoenix. Elizabeth, thank you. Joining us now is Arizona State Representative Republican David Cook. Representative Cook, thanks so much uh, for taking the time to be with us tonight. First, just tell us, if you will, what went on behind the scenes today within the Republican caucus. And just right off the bat, where do you stand on repealing your state's abortion law? Well, uh, let me say that some of that stuff is, is need to be kept private in our caucus. But we made tremendous progress in the caucus today in moving forward. It was, uh, it was pretty tough on the floor to keep everybody procedurally where I think we needed to be. The bottom line is that the 1800 law will be repealed. The Senate has taken some action today over there. 
Uh, the speaker, I just had to go down and vote on the floor to get adjourned. But we are making progress within our caucus. And I think that you will see some action possibly next Wednesday to go ahead and, and get that law repealed. And then there will be some further action that we'll do in the state in the following few weeks. So just a short time ago, your colleagues in, in the, uh, the Senate, uh, the Arizona Senate, started the process for their own bill. They're expected to return, as you said, next Wednesday to continue that process. I'm wondering, do you think the House would take up their repeal bill by then? Yeah, and, and, that, and that's part of the issue here, is that we don't need uh, knee-jerk reactions to bypass the rules and the normal order of business. You know, this is not an emergency. Whether this law or, or the bill gets passed and the governor signs it uh, next week or the week after, it still won't go into effect until 90 days after we complete the legislative session. So we're not on a time clock because we're still working on the budget. And what we don't want to do is, is, is not get as much done in this arena as that we possibly can. Because when this law is reversed, then the law of 2022 becomes law of the land. And, and I believe that that is insignificant. We need to make some exceptions to the 2022 law. And so we need to figure out how all of these things can be done. I'm wondering if the bill that the Republicans are working on takes out or, or allows for uh, exceptions for rape and incest. Well, well, that's where we're at today. And, and it's like a three-part series. So, so the 1864 law is part of it. The 2022 law, which doesn't allow for that either, and, and I've talked to from the governor's staff to other members across the aisle today, uh, my own caucus today, we need to make sure that if we repeal this law, then how do we put those in? Who would vote against uh, for rape or incest being added to the 2022 law when, in fact, it just makes out for the life of the mother and then the 15-week ban? So if we can set the 15 weeks aside and not address that as a Republican caucus, but add the rape and incest part of it in and reach across the aisle, let's come together, let's get it fixed, let, let's make sure that the abortion law in Arizona is something that Arizonans can live with, because it's going to be on the books one way or the other, and this law is going to be repealed. I know you can't talk about the behind the scenes stuff, but when you talk about someone who wants to allow an abortion up to the ninth month, like to the to the day before abortion, are you talking uh, the day before birth? Are you talking about specific colleagues? Has someone put that forward? Well, I believe that's what the ballot initiative, if it makes the ballot and they turn in, because I haven't read it yet, but but they haven't turned in their signatures yet. And they told they told us they have over five hundred thousand. They need about three hundred fifty thousand to put it on the ballot then it would be enshrined in our constitution that would allow uh, abortions all the way up to till birth. And I don't think that's where the majority of Arizonans are. I don't think many of Arizonans I hopefully aren't there, but I do think that women are intelligent. They run large companies. They're great elected officials. They run large cities where they're in counties, uh, governments, state governments. We have a woman governor again in the state of Arizona. We have a woman attorney general. I can't believe that people would think we can have women in these elected positions and running these large companies that make great decisions not be able to have the ability to make a, a decision of this matter. So I know the country's going to be watching to see if the 1864 law stands. Uh, you say it won't. We will be watching. Uh, Ari it, it Arizona, won't. State it, it won't. Arizona State Representative David Cook, thank you so much for taking the time and explaining it to us. We appreciate it. You bet. Thank you so much. Tonight, millions of Americans are facing the possibility of dangerous, severe weather, and we've already seen quite a few confirmed tornadoes. Look at this. Storm chasers captured this video of this massive twister forming in Iowa. Those storm chasers finding themselves inside the swirling winds, their vehicle right in the middle of all that blowing debris. And in nearby New London, Iowa, a home destroyed by the wind, neighbors showing up to help as they often do. And tonight, this system is headed east with a new one behind it. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano tracking it all. Tonight, an outbreak of powerful storms barreling east, targeting millions for a third straight night. High winds and torrential rain hammering Detroit's airport. Tornado sirens sounding in Michigan's capital. The warnings forcing House lawmakers to take shelter in the basement for a time. Look at that funnel. More than 100 damaging storm reports in the last 24 hours. It's in the field behind us. Storm chasers north of Houghton, Iowa, practically engulfed by a forming tornado. Oh my God! 
Yes! Then riding alongside it as it regenerates into a monster EF2 wedge. Winds of over 110 miles per hour. Not far from there in New London, devastating damage to multiple homes. Residents coming from miles around to help clean up. And just north of Kansas City in Smithville, Missouri, families cleaning up after a 95 mile per hour EF1 tornado ripped off roofs and upended Kevin Kemp's whole life. It's just a gut punch to know that, I mean, this is all I had. A new system threatening the same area again tonight. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, who else is going to see severe weather tonight into tomorrow? Well, uh, Phil, we, we just have another hour or so left of seeing the severe weather tonight. Then it'll wind down quickly. But the folks who have gotten, especially in Ohio today and in through western Pennsylvania this evening, uh, heavy winds and some tornadic cells are going to be possible. We've got that watch up until midnight officially. The rain's already at the leading edge of them here in, in through New York City. This will wind down pretty quickly after midnight. The next system, though, is winding up. It's dropping into the plains. A cluster of thunderstorms, probably severe storms, will drop across o Omaha down to Kansas City. The areas where that saw those tornadoes yesterday tonight shouldn't be a tornado threat tomorrow will be and that threat will stretch from Waco Dallas all the way up the Ohio River into Indi Evansville Indiana and that that bullseye right there right over the heartland that's where we see think we'll see the highest uh, tornado risk late in the day and through tomorrow night and it looks like it's going to be our fourth night in the row where we'll see tornadic thunderstorms Phil yeah more dangerous weather Rob thanks so much on Capitol Hill today, that Boeing whistleblower delivered stunning testimony on the safety of Boeing airplanes. The longtime Boeing engineer claiming Boeing 787 Dreamliner could fall apart after years of use. Boeing is fiercely denying those claims. Gio Benitez reports. Tonight, Boeing scrutinized on Capitol Hill, the company under fire for months after that door plug flew off a of Boeing 737 MAX 9 at 16,000 feet. I have serious concerns about the safety of the 787 and 777 aircraft. Whistleblower Sam Salapur, an engineer who's worked with Boeing for 17 years, alleging that 787 Dreamliners are at risk of breaking apart in midair after extensive use because, he says, the fuselage isn't fastened together properly. I have raised these issues over three years. I was ignored. Salapur was eventually moved from the 787 program to the 777, where he says he saw more issues. I literally saw people jumping on the pieces of the airplane to get them to align. But during the hearing, the whistleblower provided no evidence to support his claims. Boeing halted 787 deliveries for nearly two years to address these issues. The FAA signed off on the fixes. The company standing behind its fleet saying a 787 can safely operate for at least 30 years before needing expanded airframe maintenance routines, extensive and rigorous testing of the fuselage and heavy maintenance checks of nearly 700 in-service airplanes to date have found zero evidence of airframe fatigue and that they are fully confident in the 777, which has safely flown more than 3.9 billion passengers around the world. Boeing has been pushing back hard against these claims, saying that these aircrafts, they're safe. Do you believe them? The aircraft as a whole may be safe insofar as people getting on planes shouldn't panic. But they need to be made fully safe. And that whistleblower first went to the FAA in January with his concerns. The FAA tells us it is investigating those allegations. Phil? Geo, thanks. Republicans' move to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has failed in the Senate. Let's get right to ABC's Rachel Scott on Capitol Hill. And Rachel, that didn't take long. It didn't take long at all. In fact, this Republican effort to try to convict the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas went down in less than three hours. Democrats quickly dismissing those charges before the trial even really got underway. Remember, House Republicans impeached the Homeland Security Secretary over his handling of the border, but they failed to provide any evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors. Tonight, the White House responding, saying that Republicans should stop wasting their time on baseless political stunts, Phil. And Rachel, the other breaking news today, Speaker Mike Johnson releasing aid bills to help both Israel and Ukraine. Uh, the vote's coming by the end of the week, even as efforts to oust him grow. Uh, Johnson knows full well, right, that he needs Democrats to pass those bills, putting his speakership in jeopardy. Where do things stand? 
Yeah, exactly, Phil. And in fact, just moments ago, the Speaker of the House was asked directly why he believes it's worth risking his job to put additional aid to Ukraine on the floor for a vote. And he said it's because it's the right thing to do. So he is moving forward with this sort of complicated plan, bringing that $95 billion package that the Senate passed with additional aid for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, and splitting it up into four separate votes. As you mentioned, we are expecting to see votes on those measures by the end of the week. And as for that push to try to oust Speaker Johnson from his position. It's unclear when or if Republicans are going to make good on those threats, Phil. All right, Rachel Scott from Capitol Hill. Rachel, thank you. Tonight, tensions in the Middle East are ratcheting up. Hezbollah striking Israel from the north, injuring more than a dozen Israeli soldiers. And Prime Minister Netanyahu making his first public comment since Iran's direct attack. And tonight, what ABC News has learned about two separate moments when Israel was set to retaliate against Iran but then stopped. The U.S. also now promising new sanctions on Iran. ABC's Matt Gutman in Israel for us tonight. Tonight, with Israel vowing to retaliate against Iran, tensions ratcheting higher as the Iranian-backed group Hezbollah launched this attack on an Israeli military base in northern Israel. The drones crashing into this village, then that fireball. Hezbollah releasing this video, POV of the drone in that death dive. 18 wounded, including 14 Israeli soldiers. And as the world waits to see how Israel responds to Iran, sources telling ABC News that on at least two nights this week, Israel prepared, then aborted, retaliatory strikes against Iran. <laughs> and in his first public comment since Iran's massive missile attack Saturday, a defiant Prime Minister Netanyahu signaling Israel will do everything necessary to defend itself. And tonight, Israel's president revealing new video from October 7th to remind the world that there are still hostages being held by Hamas. You see the kidnapping of Yarden Bibas, the father of the two youngest children abducted by Hamas. He's terrified and bloodied. These gripping images of his children, those red-headed toddlers, clutched in their mother's arms as they were taken. And in Gaza, where those hostages are still being held, the Israeli military continuing its relentless assault, striking multiple targets in southern Gaza, body bags lining the sand, dozens reported killed over the last 24 hours, including at least four children. Matt joins us now from Tel Aviv. And Matt, what is Iran threatening tonight? And what are you learning about any possible Israeli strike? Iran held this massive military parade today, Phil, uh, with drones and some of the missiles that Iran launched against Israel over the weekend. And they vowed a severe and fierce response to any Israeli retaliation. That is, U.S. and Israeli sources are now telling us that at this point, if Israel decides to retaliate, it's unlikely to happen until after the Passover holiday is over, which is at the end of the month. Phil. All right. Matt Gutman from Tel Aviv. Matt, thank you. President Biden kicked off three days of campaigning across his home state of Pennsylvania, doubling down on his call for higher taxes on the rich. The president seeking to gain ground in the battleground state, while Donald Trump spends much of the week in New York for his criminal trial. Biden has proposed a 25 percent minimum tax rate for billionaires as part of his plan to raise nearly five trillion in revenue over 10 years. Authorities are confirming they have found the bodies of two missing mothers who were last seen on their way to pick up their children for a birthday party. Tonight, authorities have more details on the four suspects and the children's grandmother at the center of the plot. Here's ABC's Maria Villarreal. In Oklahoma today, the first court appearance for four suspects accused of kidnapping and murdering two mothers who vanished on their way to pick up children for a birthday party. It's very sad. Those two ladies should still be here with their kids. Investigators say the children's grandmother was at the center of a plot to kill her former daughter-in-law, Veronica Butler, after a long fight for custody of the children. Today, the victim's family lashing out at those suspects in court. So much anger, frustration. How can you hate the mother of your grandchildren so much that you want to end her life? Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly were driving from Kansas to pick up Butler's kids for that birthday party. Kelly riding along to supervise a court-ordered visitation. Police finding their car abandoned with blood and a broken hammer nearby. Their bodies found two weeks later. This case did not end the way we had hoped. 
Um, it has certainly been a tragedy for everybody involved. Tonight, Veronica Butler's family heartbroken. Everybody needs to know how great of a mom she was because there should have been no reason why she had to have that custody battle for so long. That young mother, Veronica Butler, was actually set to be in court today, expecting to get you know, unsupervised visitation with her young children. But instead, reporters in that Oklahoma courtroom say that her father actually had to be held back. He was so full of anger and frustration as he watched the suspects in his daughter's murder get charged. Phil? All right, Maria, thank you. There is a new development to bring to you in the Idaho College murders. Attorneys for accused killer Brian Koberger had a deadline of today to submit documents related to his alibi for the night of the murders. Four University of Idaho students were stabbed to death in an off-campus home. In a court filing, Koberger's attorneys claimed he was driving around alone when the murders were committed in November of 2022. No trial date has been set for the case. There is still much more to get to here tonight on Prime. An NBA player is permanently banned from the league for allegedly gambling on games. But next, homelessness is one of the most prominent crises facing our country. Now a growing number of communities are taking steps to make it a crime to sleep outdoors, even if there are no other options. The Supreme Court is preparing to tackle the issue. A closer look at the argument in tonight's Prime Focus. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies, play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. Can you believe it? It's 25 years of breakfast in bed, surprising moms across America. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And for our 25th anniversary, we're making it the biggest surprise yet. A full-on breakfast in bed extravaganza like you have never seen before. So go to goodmorningamerica.com or scan this QR code to find out how to enter a deserving mom you love for breakfast in bed. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. 
Welcome back. Sprawling encampments of unhoused people dotting many of the country's biggest cities are ubiquitous reminders of homelessness here in America. But now, a growing number of communities are taking what's being seen as punitive approach to clear them out, making it a crime in some places to sleep outside, even when some say they have nowhere else to go. So is it cruel and unusual punishment? The Supreme Court will tackle that question next week. And Devin Dwyer reports for us from Grants Pass, Oregon, about what's at stake. On the banks of the Rogue River, tucked away under trees on the side of the road, even in center field of the local Little League ballpark, the homelessness epidemic is inescapable, even in sleepy Grants Pass, Oregon. Population 40,000, roughly 600 call parks like this one home. Brandon, a 38-year-old Grants Pass native, says he has no choice. So the city came in and said, you can't camp right there on those wood chips. They, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the officer said I was too close to the playground and I was too close to the, to the fence. Local law requires that he move his camp every 72 hours. The city had tried to ban camping in parks outright, but was blocked by a federal court for now. If I don't feel like I, just, I, I belong, I'm going to feel like an outsider and then I'm going to want to continue doing the same thing because there's no reason to, to thrive for anything different. There's no place to go. Helen Cruz knows the indignity no firsthand. Over five years living in parks before a nearby church took her in, she says she received more than $5,000 in camping-related fines. I was holding down two jobs when I was out here, and uh, still not enough to be able to rent a place. Their, their uh, terms of low-income housing here is $1,000 a month, and that's, that's not workable either, you know. So when the police come through and they do a sweep of this area, what do they do? What do they tell you? If you don't comply, you are trespassed and you could possibly go to jail. The city of Grants Pass is among a growing number of American communities passing laws to crack down on homeless encampments. A perfect storm of skyrocketing housing prices, sunsetting COVID relief programs, a mental health and drug abuse crisis, and an aging population without retirement savings has led to record numbers of unhoused people nationwide. For all intents and purposes, a lot of the behavior you see here today uh, is illegal. And then our community will ask, well, what are you doing about it, Chief? Chief Warren Hensman says his officers are caught in the middle. We have community members in Grants Pass that are afraid to come to their parks. We've had shootings in our parks. We've had fights in our parks, chronic drug abuse in our parks. So, so much of our citizenry are not walking through our parks. In 2013, the city passed an ordinance banning anyone from using a blanket, pillow, or cardboard box for protection from the elements while sleeping in public. Local Representative Dwayne Yunker says it was intended to crack down on unsanitary conditions and crime. Critics of Grants Pass say the, the council has tried to criminalize homelessness. Is that what's going on here? We do have a responsibility to keep people safe. And that's the struggle, is how we keep everybody safe. Is it safe to have a kid play in the park where there's a tent 20 feet away? I don't know what the people in the tent are doing. But with no public shelters inside city limits, a group of homeless residents alleged the new law was cruel and unusual punishment. They sued in federal court and won. We're fighting between what the law is telling us and what the people want us to do and trying to make everybody happy. That's a big, huge struggle for us city government. Criminalizing the, the victims of our failed housing policy is morally wrong and it's unconstitutional and that's essentially what the, city's, the city of Grants Pass has done by making it illegal for someone to exist while being homeless. I had a beautiful vegetable garden. I love to cook. Laura, a 55-year-old Grants Pass native and mother of three, says homelessness hit suddenly after her husband died in 2021 and mm -hmm. health problems sent her to the hospital. So, um, Have you been ticketed by the city? <laughs> yeah. Um, I have over a dozen citations. And what are the citations for? Um, mostly for scattering rubbish, and that means that uh, anything outside of your eight foot by eight foot diameter limits is considered rubbish, trash. 
Her home is now a tent in this park. I needed well, a little bit of color out here. here. A single daffodil, one small sign, Laura is clinging to hope. There's those of us that are struggling and fighting and taking one step out as we're digging out of the hole. <laughs> you have nowhere else to go. Yeah, yeah. But across the river... You've got 78 beds in this building. Mm -hmm. It's only half full. Why is that? Uh, well, there's a lot of reasons. So this is what we call our 30-day dorm. Brian Boteller says the doors are open at the only private homeless shelter in town, the Grants Pass Gospel Rescue Mission. For over 40 years, it's provided warm beds and meals, but with religious requirements. How many times a day do they so go to chapel? Twice a day, our guys go to, go to chapel. They go to chapel once in the morning, once in the evening. The Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Residents must also quit smoking, drinking, and drug use use and give up their pets. The Ninth Circuit said that it's cruel and unusual punishment sure. on the part of Grants Pass to cite and fine some homeless folks for living in the park when there's right. nowhere else to go. Well, that's the part, that's the big question. Is there nowhere else to go? Or is there just nowhere else that they want to go? Boteller says so long as courts say Grants Pass cannot ban camping in public, more people will choose to stay on the streets. We've seen a drop in our residency, and we've seen an increase in people in our parks and freeway underpasses and, and that kind of stuff in places where they ought not be. Cities from Phoenix to Los Angeles to Seattle have joined Grants Pass in appealing to the U.S. Supreme Court. These encampments in California are unacceptable. Elected officials from both parties urging the justices to make it easier for cities to clear tent encampments like these. It's not acceptable for anyone to call the streets or a park their home. And cities need to have these ordinances so that they can help to incentivize people to accept offers of help. That's what these laws do. The reality is um, the only thing that works is more permanent, affordable housing. This case is not going to solve homelessness. If we prevail in this case, our homeless problem is still going to be there. It just means that we can't criminalize people while they're homeless. For Helen Cruz and Brandon, a lot is on the line. We're just a small little community with a really big homeless problem and no place to put us. Yeah, a problem Devin points out is all across this country. There is still much more to get to, and coming up, a valedictorian's commencement speech canceled due to security concerns. Now, the openly pro-Palestinian USC student is speaking out about the school's decision. But next, Gen Z says goodbye to Google, what the younger generation is opting to use instead of that search engine. By the numbers. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies or play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. Involuntary manslaughter charges against parents of the shooter at Oxford High School who killed four students and wounded others. There's a myth that the shooter just snaps. It's just not true. There are always signs he was crying for help and being ignored. He had pictures of a target on his bedroom wall, shell casings on his nightstand. A very toxic, turbulent relationship. Those people are yikes. The life they lived was just crazy. The sexting and the really terrible things they'd video of their sexual acts. They purchased that gun for him with his money and bragged about it. They're being told by a school counselor that he thinks their son's going to kill himself, and they knew nothing. As soon as I heard they were called to the school that day, the messages about LOL, don't get caught, those were very, very concerning to me. That's the moment that no juror is going to think, well, haven't we all been there? Here's what it is. I got it. They do not seem shocked about him having the gun. There was no shock. Zero. School shooters aren't created, they're made, and it's made over time. You don't get to walk away from that. You just don't. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. 
Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. For so many years, the narrative around the royal family was completely celebratory. And suddenly, they were at the center of upsetting stories. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Kate Middleton had not been seen in public for months. Something fishy is going on, and when it finally gets revealed, it is going to be huge. Of course, the mystery of a missing woman and a royal doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. A lot of people that have been filing awful stuff on the internet were shamed. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis regarding their future when it came to their popularity. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. This is Impact by Nightline. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? People say it'd be great if they all got back together. It's like saying, well, when will the Beatles reform? It's not going to happen. Now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. I'm Matt Rivers, and that is the Panama Canal. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. The House bill threatening to ban TikTok if its Chinese owners don't sell it has been sitting in the Senate for the past month. But the bill could quickly become law if House Speaker Mike Johnson folds it into new foreign aid bills for Ukraine and Israel. Meantime, some fresh data shows younger TikTok users no longer just use it for social media, but also to find some basic information. And that is tonight's By the Numbers. There is no question traditional search engines still dominate. 85% of people told statistics that Google is their go-to. The number two and three search engines are nowhere even close. Just 27% of people surveyed use Yahoo. And Microsoft's Bing was regularly utilized by 23% of respondents. But Google's hold on people aged 18 to 24 appears to be weakening. One-fifth of that cohort told the youth research firm YPulse that TikTok is where they begin their searches for information. And though 58% of those aged 25 to 39 still say Google is their first stop for knowledge, that number falls to 46% for computer users aged 18 to 24. TikTok, of course, is not the only social media app putting dents into traditional search engines. Reddit and more recently Threads have both grown. And there is much more ahead here on Prime. Fans up in arms over the pay disparity between men and women rookies in professional basketball. We're going to take a look at the gap and the hopes to close it. An iconic TV actor with a story that extends far beyond the stars. My conversation with actor, activist, and social justice icon George Takei about his new book on a dark chapter in American history. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. And the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now wherever you stream your news. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. They're the most mysterious creatures on Earth. They're masterminds. Shapeshifters. They're just so incredibly alien. And yet, more like us than we ever could have imagined. What more do they have to tell us? was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. A tragedy in a small town. A church pastor is dead. Shot in the back. People were like, what? The preacher's wife? There had to be a good reason, some speculated, to pick up that shotgun and shoot her husband. 2020, Friday night on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. The NBA permanently banning a player following an investigation over gambling violations. Time reveals its list of 100 most influential people of 2024 and an elephant on the run. Those stories and more in tonight's rundown. The NBA has permanently banned Toronto's Raptors player Jonte Porter following an investigation over gambling violations. The league said Porter had disclosed confidential information to sports bettors, limited his own participation in games for betting purposes, and bet on NBA games himself. The investigation found that during a Raptors game on March 20th, Porter had spoken with a better about his own health status before the game and then only played three minutes claiming to be ill, which influenced wagers on his performance. The NBA said the investigation is still open. The Justice Department and attorneys for 100 victims of Larry Nassar are in the final stages of a settlement. Sources tell ABC News the deal could pay tens of millions of dollars to resolve claims that the FBI failed to investigate allegations of abuse levied against the former gymnastics team doctor. The claims were brought in 2022 by a number of athletes and patients who reported being abused by Nassar including Olympic gymnast Simone Biles, Ali Raisman, and Michaela Moroni. A 16-year-old male in Philadelphia was shot as he answered the door. WPVI says the teen was babysitting his two younger cousins who were asleep on the couch nearby. Philadelphia police said he was shot in the abdomen and arm just before midnight. He was taken to the hospital and is in stable condition. Police said the two children were not hurt. No arrests have been made. Olivia Munn revealing new details of her breast cancer journey, opening up to People magazine about her fight. It makes you realize that, like, cancer does not care who you are. One year ago, Munn was diagnosed with luminal B, a fast-growing and aggressive type of breast cancer. Within 30 days, she underwent a double mastectomy, where she says doctors found another cancer mass the size of a tangerine. I really try to be prepared, but the truth is that nothing Nothing could prepare me for what I would feel like, what it would look like. Here's something you don't see on the streets of Montana often. Oh my God. Viola the elephant took off from a circus visiting Butte after she was spooked by a car backfiring. Viola wandered up and down the local streets surprising locals. She was eventually corralled again after 10 minutes. 
Time Magazine has revealed the Time 100, a list of some of the most influential people globally in 2024. Four honorees were chosen for the covers. Singer-songwriter Dua Lipa, NFL star Patrick Mahomes, actor Taraji P. Henson, and Russian opposition leader Yulia Navalny. Time will celebrate the 100 who made the list at the Time 100 Gala, which will air in prime time on May 12th on ABC. The Israel-Hamas war has presented a serious challenge for colleges. We've seen it all across the country. Now USC is not allowing its valedictorian, who's publicly supported Palestinians, to give a speech at next month's commencement citing security concerns. It is a decision that has been praised by several pro-Israel groups, but criticized by the country's largest Muslim civil rights organization. The student at the center of this controversy joins us now, Asna Tabassum. Asna, uh, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. I want to start with this statement that the college provost said in part that the intensity of the feelings around allowing you to speak, quote, escalated to the point of creating substantial risk relating to security and uh, disruption at the commencement, pointing out harassment and violence seen on other campuses. But, you know, I know you had a meeting with them. I'm wondering, did they tell you anything specific, a specific threat that was made against you? Or have you had any specific threats made against you? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I will have to say, no, nothing specific was, you know, offered to me. No specific details regarding security threats or safety concerns were offered to me. So a lot of people, and you kind of, you know, uh, talk, talk about this a little bit, but a lot of people, cr cr the criticism of you, your classmates, some of them feel like that this goes back to a link. You know, you've talked about this. It's posted on social media to a, a, a site there. Uh, another person created this, we should point out. You did not create it. You posted it to a site. Some I believe it contains anti-Semitic views, uh, really some vile anti-Semitic views, including calling for the abolishment of the state of Israel. So do you think that's part of it? And do you believe the state of Israel should be abolished? So the when it comes to abolishing the state of Israel, I do want to point out the rest of the link. And so the very next sentence talks about the peaceful coexistence of Arabs and Jews. And I think it points to what I've been saying since the beginning of this issue, which is that I'm committed to human equality and to human rights. And so this link, I I encourage people to look at it in its entirety rather than looking at one specific example. For example, you know, it's discussing both the one state and the two state solution. It's discussing the history of the region. And I think that there's important information to, for people to understand on their own and come to their own conclusions about. When it comes to abolishing the state of Israel, I will say I want to abolish apartheid. If there is one state and two state in there, you, you could see a two state solution. I, I think the abolishment of Israel is what bothered a lot of people, but you would advocate for a two state solution so Israel would still exist and then there would be a Palestinian state. Is that what I'm hearing? So no, I'm not necessarily committing to a one state or a two state solution. I'm simply saying that this information on the website offered information from multiple perspectives. And so my endorsing of any one single perspective is unfounded. Okay, so USC has said this is not meant to infringe upon your free speech. Do you feel like it's doing just that? So in its most technical terms, um, the ability to give a speech at commencement is a privilege, right? It's, it's not necessarily free speech. But what I will say that, you know, I expressed my views and I expressed my views online and the hatred that was leveled at me because of myself expressing these views, um, you know, I think ultimately was part of the reason why USC caved in. And so whether free speech in its most technical terms is being debated here is maybe up for debate. But I will say speech is an issue and speech is being stifled. What were you going to speak about? I mean, there's this a lot of talk about what you posted, that link, and what your beliefs may be. Were you going to talk about that at graduation or were you going to give a different kind of speech? So the valedictorian honor is ultimately a unifying honor, right? It's emblematic of USC's unifying values. And I think I take that to heart, you know? Um, I, I wanted my speech to be in the genre of a valedictory speech. And so that being said, I wanted to impart a message of hope. I also wanted to impart a message of responsibility, right? 
We are given a wonderful set of higher education. We have been given the knowledge of learning how to learn. And so I wanted to encourage my peers to, you know, learn about the world and come to their own conclusions and then act to change the world in the ways that they see fit. And so ultimately taking in my role as valedictorian, I wanted to be a unifying voice for all students. And that was preemptively taken away from me. All right, Asna, thanks so much. Uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time. Of course, thank you so much. Some fans are up in arms about how much professional women's basketball players earn as a base salary compared to the men. But as Zuring Shah reports, there is some hope that with superstar Caitlin Clark, things could change. Clark! Oh, my! As the major stars in women's basketball prepare for the bright lights of the WNBA... Angel Reese. The salaries that await them, which some are calling extremely low, exposing a wide but very real gender pay gap in professional basketball. She's going to make millions for the WNBA, and she's getting $76,000 next year. According to SpotRack, Caitlin Clark, Cameron Brink, Camila Cardozo, Rikia Jackson are all tied for the highest female rookie salaries, estimated to make $76,535 this year. This is slightly less than the average mean wage in America last year. Are they doing DoorDash on the side to survive? I mean, I know you ain't buying a house on that salary. Incoming WNBA players like Clark and Angel Reese already cashing in in other ways, piggybacking off their NIL deals with endorsements and partnerships that far exceed the WNBA salaries. But most current WNBA players need to supplement their income by playing overseas. It's a sharp contrast to last year's top three picks in the NBA rookie class, who averaged around $10 million a year. But the WNBA has never generated the same kind of revenue Revenue as the NBA. It's because of fans' lack of interest, not watching, not buying products, not buying tickets. That's why we are where we are right now. But that can change, and I think it will change because of what we're watching. The much-anticipated WNBA season, driven by the record ratings for women's college basketball and a draft night which saw more viewers than the NBA draft has seen in more than two decades, it could shake up the professional sports landscape. We are witnessing a transformational moment in sports that we may not experience for generations. Support for the WNBA is continuing to grow. On Tuesday, Clark spoke to GMA about going pro. I worked really hard for it, um, and I think that's what I'm really proud of is, like, I earned it. I deserved it. Clark steps back, fires, you bet! And all of this is a really good sign to move the conversation forward as the WNBA starts to negotiate a new rights deal, a new TV rights deal, which they will be doing very soon. Zareen, thank you. Many of you know him best as Hikaru Sulu from the Star Trek series, but his, his journey extends far beyond the stars. His new book, My Lost Freedom, details his experience growing up in Japanese-American internment camps during World War II. Joining us now is a true legend, actor, activist, social justice icon, George Takei. Sir, thanks so much for joining us. Good to be with you. Appreciate it. You're teaching us things already, not just in this book. Um, this, this book details a really, a, you know, a dark chapter uh, in this country's history and in your own personal history. Um, why did you want to tackle it in a children's book? Well, I was a child then. I was five years old, and I wanted to share, I've shared this story uh, as uh, an autobiography that was published in uh, 1994. Uh, I did also a uh, graphic memoir uh, because I wanted to reach uh, teenagers. And uh, as a teenager, I love comic mm. books. So I, I told the same story as uh, from the vantage point of a teenager uh, to reach them. But w with this one book, my lost, uh, I lost freedom. Uh, I'm reaching for two generations, the parents and their kiddies. Absolutely, because it's not just the kids reading it, it's the, the adults reading it to the children and having a conversation. Exactly. Opening up a conversation. I'm wondering, I know you wrote about it, um, it you know, in the book that came out in 1994, and this, this is a different way of talking about it. Um, is it painful to relive this period, or is it cathartic, therapeutic in a way? 
I think for my parents, uh, the greatest pain was felt. I was uh, five years old, four years, five, six, seven, eight, four years of my life uh, in imprisonment. My brother was a year younger than me, and our baby sister went in as an infant. And so the first four years of her life uh, was behind those barbed wire fences. How did your family keep hope going? So I remember the terror, the confusion, uh, the chaos of being moved constantly from one place to another, one strange part of the country to another. And so I, that's my real memory that I have. But I didn't understand what that was all about. And as a teenager, out of camp and a few years of having elapsed, I was very curious about my childhood imp imprisonment. And uh, I went to libraries to look for books on it. Couldn't find a mm. thing. Had, do you think it had anything to do with you growing up, you know, having the career you had, but being the activist you have turned into? Do you think it, it shaped you in that way? Well, as I said, those uh, after dinner conversations uh, that I had with my father, he said, and he loved uh, quoting from uh, the Gettysburg Address, President Lincoln's uh, yeah. uh, 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 historic speech. Our, ours is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. He said those are noble words. That's what makes American democracy so singular. But those words are also the weakness of American democracy because it's a people's democracy. And people are fallible human beings. And they get swept up by the hysteria of the time and by racism, hmm. and the president is also a human being. He's, uh, there were tens of thousands of people that looked just like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor right. living on the West Coast. That weren't those people. And he signed an executive order ordering all Japanese Americans on the West Coast to be rounded up with no charge, no trial, no due process in the most un-American way to be rounded up and imprisoned in barbed wire prison camps in some of the most hellish places, des most desolate places in the country. It was, a, it was a hugely dark time in this country's history. And to be able to put it in a book like this, to not only teach children, but the adults who are reading it to them is, is a really spectacular thing. Well, I had to simplify it. Lord. Oh, absolutely. We don't deal with the loyalty No, no, absolutely. Here. George, thank you so much. We so appreciate you coming in. And you can purchase My Lost Freedom, available wherever books are sold. And that's our show for this hour. I'm Phil Lipoff. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, our coverage of Arizona's Civil War era abortion ban on the books ahead of the November election continues. Could this move the needle for voters? Plus, as Russia's war with Ukraine stretches into its third year, Russia intensifying its violent strikes. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoon. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. They're the most mysterious creatures on Earth. 
They're masterminds. Shapeshifters. They're just so incredibly alien. And yet, more like us than we ever could have imagined. What more do they have to tell us? What would you do? Uh, I was thinking I want to open up our marriage. If you heard a husband being asked to open up his marriage. I don't know if I feel comfortable that you've already, like, made decisions without me. Well, just wait until you see what our hidden cameras catch. I do not want another man in our marriage. Well, this is what I want. He is on his way. Whoa. The dinner and a show. And just wait till you see what happens when he walks in. Hell no. What would you do Sunday night? All new on ABC. Here's to good mornings in America. Can you feel the love? <laughs> oh, yeah. Mornings that inspire. Filled with hope, kindness, joyous surprises, and so much fun. This is crazy. This is absolutely crazy. Start your day with Good Morning America's Ray of Sunshine. Highlighting the best of America and helping make dreams come true. Wow. Yeah. I'm just so happy. It is so good. Get ready to smile and put the good into your morning, America, because... You know what will make the morning better? A little ray of sunshine. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies, play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And good evening, I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsey Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin with the key swing state of Arizona, moving to keep that Civil War era abortion ban on the books ahead of the November election. Despite urging from former President Trump, State House Republicans today voted down an effort to repeal the state's 1864 law banning abortion. The move by Arizona Supreme Court last week to uphold the ban set off a political firestorm across the country. The leading Republicans Senate candidate Carrie Lake came out against the ban. Vice President Harris traveled to the state to campaign in recent days. Ultimately, voters may have the final say, as Arizona is one of 14 states where abortion could be on the ballot this November. Elizabeth Schulze leads us off on the ground in Arizona. Tonight, Arizona Republican lawmakers refusing to repeal one of the toughest abortion laws in the country, a law written during the Civil War more than 160 years ago, banning abortion in all cases except to save the life of the mother. The last thing we should be doing today is rushing a bill through the legislative process. Democrats outraged. We're talking about a bill that was passed before Arizona was even a state, before women had the right to vote. But Republican lawmakers tonight defending the law. We have the best law possible on the books right now. The 1864 law is the best law yes. possible. Yes. A law that is makes abortion impossible for women in every circumstance except for to save a mother's life. Arizona is a pro-life state. And that law was put into place by people that believe in the sanctity of life. Arizona, one of 21 states to ban or severely restrict abortion since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Donald Trump has boasted of nominating three of the five justices who overturned Roe. We broke Roe v. Wade and we did something that nobody thought was possible. We gave it back to the states and the states are working very brilliantly. Still, Trump says Arizona went too far. He knows that voters will likely have the last word on the matter. Arizona, one of 14 states where abortion could be on the ballot this fall. Abortion rights has won wherever it's gone before voters, including in conservative states like Kansas, Kentucky, and Ohio. Today, Republican lawmakers told me they're not worried. Voters are smart. They would rather vote for somebody that they respect and disagree with than somebody who doesn't believe in anything. Elizabeth joins us now. Uh, Elizabeth, Arizona is a key battleground state. We know that. But it's not just the candidates on the upcoming ballot. 
That's right, Phil. As we say, 14 states at least are expected to include abortion measures on the ballot, meaning it will be up to voters to decide where they stand on this issue. When it's been on the ballot in the past, it drives up turnout. And in every instance, the abortion rights position has won. Phil. All right. Elizabeth Schulze from Phoenix. Elizabeth, thank you. Tonight, millions of Americans are facing the possibility of dangerous, severe weather, and we've already seen quite a few confirmed tornadoes. Storm chasers capturing this video of a massive twister forming in Iowa. Those same storm chasers finding themselves inside the swirling winds, their vehicle, as you see, in the middle of all that blowing debris. And in nearby New London, Iowa, a home destroyed by the wind, neighbors showing up as they do to help. And tonight, this system is headed east with a new one behind it. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano tracking it all. Tonight, an outbreak of powerful storms barreling east, targeting millions for a third straight night. High winds and torrential rain hammering Detroit's airport. Tornado sirens sounding in Michigan's capital. The warnings forcing House lawmakers to take shelter in the basement for a time. Look at that funnel. More than 100 damaging storm reports in the last 24 hours. It's in the field behind us. Storm chasers north of Houghton, Iowa, practically engulfed by a forming tornado. Oh my gosh! Then riding alongside it as it regenerates into a monster EF2 wedge. Winds of over 110 miles per hour. Not far from there in New London, devastating damage to multiple homes. Residents coming from miles around to help clean up. And just north of Kansas City in Smithville, Missouri, families cleaning up after a 95 mile per hour EF1 tornado ripped off roofs and upended Kevin Kemp's whole life. It's just a gut punch to know that, I mean, this is all I had. A new system threatening the same area again tonight. ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano joins us now. Rob, who else is going to see severe weather tonight into tomorrow? Well, uh, Phil, we, we just have another hour or so left of seeing the severe weather tonight, then it'll wind down quickly. But the folks who have gotten, especially in Ohio today and in through western Pennsylvania this evening, uh, heavy winds and some tornadic cells are going to be possible. We've got that watch up until midnight officially. The rain's already at the leading edge of them here in, in through New York City. This will wind down pretty quickly after midnight. The next system, though, is winding up. It's dropping into the plains. A cluster of thunderstorms, probably severe storms, will drop across o Omaha down to Kansas City, the areas where that saw those tornadoes yesterday tonight shouldn't be a tornado threat tomorrow will be and that threat will stretch from Waco Dallas all the way up the Ohio River into Indi Evansville Indiana and that that bullseye right there right over the heartland that's where we see think we'll see the highest uh, tornado risk late in the day and through tomorrow night and it looks like it's going to be our fourth night in the row where we'll see tornadic thunderstorms Phil yeah more dangerous weather Rob thanks so much and on Capitol Hill today, that Boeing whistleblower delivered stunning testimony on the safety of the company's airplanes. The longtime Boeing engineer claiming Boeing's 787 Dreamliner could fall apart after years of use. Boeing is fiercely denying those claims. Gio Benitez reports. Tonight, Boeing scrutinized on Capitol Hill, the company under fire for months after that door plug flew off a Boeing 737 MAX 9 at 16,000 feet. I have serious concerns about the safety of the 787 and 777 aircraft. Whistleblower Sam Salapur, an engineer who's worked with Boeing for 17 years, alleging that 787 Dreamliners are at risk of breaking apart in midair after extensive use because, he says, the fuselage isn't fastened together properly. I have raised these issues over three years. I was ignored. Salapur was eventually moved from the 787 program to the 777, where he says he saw more issues. I literally saw people jumping on the pieces of the airplane to get them to align. But during the hearing, the whistleblower provided no evidence to support his claims. Boeing halted 787 deliveries for nearly two years to address these issues. The FAA signed off on the fixes. The company standing behind its fleet saying a 787 can safely operate for at least 30 years before needing expanded airframe maintenance routines, extensive and rigorous testing of the fuselage and heavy maintenance checks of nearly 700 in-service airplanes to date have found zero evidence of airframe fatigue and that they are fully confident in the 777, which has safely flown more than 3.9 billion passengers around the world. Boeing has been pushing back hard against these claims, saying that these aircrafts, they're safe. Do you believe them? The aircraft as a whole may be safe insofar as people getting on planes, 
shouldn't panic. But they need to be made fully safe. All right, let's bring in our Sam Sweeney now for more. Sam, what stood out to you and, and what exactly is the whistleblower claiming here? Well, what stood out to me is that, one, there has been no evidence provided to the public substantiating these claims. This whistleblower is talking about a problem that was addressed by Boeing back in 2020. Take it, they took it so seriously that they actually stopped deliveries of these 787 airplanes uh, because of potential problems. They went through piece by piece with the FAA and came up with solutions to fix these issues. It took nearly two years. It cost Boeing $6 billion uh, before they restarted these deliveries of the planes. They actually took a bunch of reporters on Monday through all of the processes all, uh, in the South Carolina plant. I was there with them, and they explained why this is not an issue. This is a carbon fiber plane. It is not metal uh, like previous generations of aircraft, and they say it just doesn't split apart like this man is claiming. Sam, always concerning for whistleblowers and the reason why there are laws shielding them. Uh, this whistleblower says he's been retaliated against? Yeah, he says that there have been threats from his uh, management, from his boss. He's received phone calls at home on his personal cell phone from his boss berating him. And he says he even found a bolt or a nail in his car tire that he believes happened while his car was at Boeing. But he says he cannot provide any evidence of that. All right. Sam Sweeney, thanks. Thank you. Republicans move to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas has failed in the Senate. Let's get right to ABC's Rachel Scott on Capitol Hill. And Rachel, that didn't take long. <laughs> it didn't take long at all. In fact, this Republican effort to try to convict the Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas went down in less than three hours. Democrats quickly dismissing those charges before the trial even really got underway. Remember, House Republicans impeached the Homeland Security Secretary over his handling of the border, but they failed to provide any evidence of high crimes and misdemeanors. Tonight, the White House responding, saying that Republicans should stop wasting their time on baseless political stunts, Phil. And Rachel, the other breaking news today, Speaker Mike Johnson releasing aid bills to help both Israel and Ukraine. Uh, the vote's coming by the end of the week, even as efforts to oust him grow. Uh, Johnson knows full well, right, that he needs Democrats to pass those bills, putting his speakership in jeopardy. Where do things stand? Yeah, exactly, Phil. And in fact, just moments ago, the Speaker of the House was asked directly why he believes it's worth risking his job to put additional aid to Ukraine on the floor for a vote. And he said it's because it's the right thing to do. So he is moving forward with this sort of complicated plan, bringing that $95 billion package that the Senate passed with additional aid for Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan, and splitting it up into four separate votes. As you mentioned, we are expecting to see votes on those measures by the end of the week. And as for that push to try to out Speaker Johnson from his position. It's unclear when or if Republicans are going to make good on those threats, Phil. All right, Rachel Scott from Capitol Hill. Rachel, thank you. Tonight, tensions in the Middle East are ratcheting up. Hezbollah striking Israel from the north, injuring more than a dozen Israeli soldiers. And Prime Minister Netanyahu making his first public comment since Iran's direct attack. And tonight, what ABC News has learned about two separate moments when Israel was set to retaliate against Iran, but stopped. The U.S. also now promising new sanctions on Iran. ABC's Matt Gutman in Israel for us tonight. Tonight, with Israel vowing to retaliate against Iran, tensions ratcheting higher as the Iranian-backed group Hezbollah launched this attack on an Israeli military base in northern Israel. The drones crashing into this village, then that fireball. Hezbollah releasing this video, POV of the drone in that death dive. 18 wounded, including 14 Israeli soldiers. And as the world waits to see how Israel responds to Iran, sources telling ABC News that on at least two nights this week, Israel prepared, then aborted, retaliatory strikes against Iran. <laughs> and in his first public comment since Iran's massive missile attack Saturday, a defiant Prime Minister Netanyahu signaling Israel will do everything necessary to defend itself. And tonight, Israel's president revealing new video from October 7th to remind the world that there are still hostages being held by Hamas. You see the kidnapping of Yarden Bibas, the father of the two youngest children abducted by Hamas. He's terrified and bloodied. These gripping images of his children, those red-headed toddlers, clutched in their mother's arms as they were taken. 
And in Gaza, where those hostages are still being held, the Israeli military continuing its relentless assault, striking multiple targets in southern Gaza, body bags lining the sand, dozens reported killed over the last 24 hours, including at least four children. Terrific. Matt Gutman from Tel Aviv. Matt, thank you. Authorities are confirming they have found the bodies of two missing mothers who were last seen on their way to pick up their children for a birthday party tonight. Authorities have more details on the four suspects and the children's grandmother at the center of the plot. Here's ABC's Maria Villarreal. In Oklahoma today, the first court appearance for four suspects accused of kidnapping and murdering two mothers who vanished on their way to pick up children for a birthday party. It's very sad. Those two ladies should still be here with their kids. Investigators say the children's grandmother was at the center of a plot to kill her former daughter-in-law, Veronica Butler, after a long fight for custody of the children. Today, the victim's family lashing out at those suspects in court. So much anger, frustration. How can you hate the mother of your grandchildren so much that you want to end her life? Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly were driving from Kansas to pick up Butler's kids for that birthday party. Kelly riding along to supervise a court-ordered visitation. Police finding their car abandoned with blood and a broken hammer nearby. Their bodies found two weeks later. This case did not end the way we had hoped. Um, it has certainly been a tragedy for everybody involved. Tonight, Veronica Butler's family heartbroken. Everybody needs to know how great of a mom she was because there should have been no reason why she had to have that custody battle for so long. Our thanks to Maria Villarreal. President Biden kicking off three days of campaigning across his home state of Pennsylvania, doubling down on his call for higher taxes on the rich. The president is seeking to gain ground in the key battleground state while Donald Trump spends much of the week in a New York courtroom for his first criminal trial. Biden has proposed a 25% minimum tax rate for billionaires as part of his plan to raise $4.9 trillion in revenue over 10 years. There's still much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, the country where it is now legal for anyone age 16 or older to officially change their gender. Plus, it's a long and storied history, hip hop and American politics. The two are intertwined and influence each other. My conversation with the director of the new documentary, Hip Hop and the White House. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. You guys don't know what happened that day. The day that my son died. The clock fell on my stepson. Right from the start, you've got some clear indicators of deception. You have not told us the complete truth. Yes, I did. 100%. No, you didn't. I can tell oh. by looking at it. Just, you're not a good liar. Do you think this ends in a good way? The interrogation tapes, the new 2020 true crime limited series, Monday on ABC. What's good to watch? Read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. All the exclusive and buzziest celebrity good stuff. Deals and steals with amazing savings and the coolest lifestyle tips from Good Morning America. I love that so much. GMA Life. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Your weekend just got a little better with GMA GMA Life. When it matters most, America turns to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight. From an Israeli military position near Gaza, I'm James Longman. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. Russia's assault on Ukraine is intensifying at a pretty critical time as the war stretches into its third year. Three Russian missiles slammed into an eight-story apartment building in the northern city of Chernihiv, killing at least 17 people, wounding more than 60, including women and children. Ukraine is suffering from a critical shortage of artillery ammunition, troops, and armored vehicles, allowing Russia to gradually push the front line. The Biden administration has reimposed crushing oil sanctions on Venezuela as President Maduro prepares to consolidate his rule in the country's July elections. Last year, the U.S. eased restrictions on state-run oil, gas, and mining sectors after the Maduro government agreed to work with opposition members to hold a free and competitive presidential vote. Since then, Maduro's critics have been jailed and his main political rival has been blocked from registering her candidacy. In Sweden, it is now legal for anyone age 16 or older to officially change their gender. Previously, the age limit was 18, but those under this age still need approval from a, from a guardian, a doctor, and the National Board of Health and Welfare. Sweden now joins a number of other countries with similar laws, including Denmark, Norway, Finland, and Spain. From Kanye West calling out George Bush on live television after Hurricane Katrina to Jeezy seemingly predicting the future when he released My President several months before the election of Barack Obama. Hip hop has always had a long and complicated relationship with American politics. The new documentary, Hip Hop and the White House, directed by Jesse Washington and narrated by Jeezy, examines the relationship between the most powerful American culture movement of the past 50 years and the most powerful position on the planet, the President of the United States. Let's take a look. NWA and those guys connected me because it was in the language that I speak. The Clinton years, we saw the growth of hip hop. And they said George Bush doesn't care about black people. That was supremely important. Black people were seen on television begging for help, and nobody came. Yeah, that was one of the more stunning moments. Joining me now in studio is the writer, director, filmmaker, Jesse Washington. Jesse, th thanks so much for taking the time uh, to be here tonight. Great documentary took me back <laughs> to some of my rap roots when I was in high school. Um, hip Hop in the White House, you highlight the contentious relationship uh, between hip hop and, and American politics. Um, what drew you to examine this? Just really my life story. You know, I grew up when Reagan was in the White House and I was on the receiving end of a lot of policies from the president that caused harm in our communities in terms of poverty, removal of resources. So I saw firsthand what was going on. I saw crack arrive in my neighborhood. I didn't really know what was behind it until later. And so my history with that and also growing up as a part of hip hop being a DJ, being in the park while people were inventing this culture really immersed me in the subject and allowed me to get back to it in a rather fulfilling way. What's fascinating about this and, and what I think for viewers who weren't immersed in the, in the rap culture ever, there's some really fascinating history uh, inside of this, especially Ronald Reagan being the first to bring sort of hip hop to the White House, but why he did it is just so fascinating. The documentary looks at legislation passed um, in the 70s and 80s. It created conditions of oppression and neglect that you just talked about um, in, in communities, really the birth of hip hop. Um, how did these policies directly influence hip hop music and culture? And you just mentioned a couple of them. Yeah, so hip hop is the language and the voice of the oppressed. And so some of the first hit rap records really had a message, and I use that title on purpose, Melly Mel, the message was describing life under the heel, really, of the government. And so these records started to come out and voice our plight, our struggle, and, and that was the, the voice that started to be directed first sideways and then directly at the President of the United States. Rap, hip hop has often been misunderstood by administrations, but was it was it around the Clinton administration, if I remember correctly in the documentary, where the White House started paying attention really to what rap and the culture could do for them? Yes, <laughs> there's always been this relationship of, as Kaz, Grandmaster Kaz, the pioneering MC says in the film, all right, you use me, That's right. I use you. Politics and rappers both need attention. They both need audience. 
They both brag a lot. They both talk themselves about themselves a lot. And so there's been this sort of symbiotic relationship where they're sort of uh, jostling to see who can get the upper hand. And Clinton was the first one to actually bring LL Cool J to his inauguration. Um, do you think at this moment that that rap and hip hop continues to influence politics like it did, say, 15, 20 years ago? I think it's more than ever. More so. And that's why I feel like this project is so timely, because we're coming in this huge election year. And as Maxine Waters, the congresswoman from from California, says in the film, I don't think that rap has realized its power and influence yet. We could register more voters. We could have more influence on policies if we just mobilize and unify and learn how to use our influence. And so I think it's really um, a, a pivotal moment for the relationship between hip hop and the White House now in 2024. I'm interested to see how it turns out. It's a great documentary. Thank you for it. I appreciate you teaching me some things that I didn't know even about the time that I lived through. Uh, Jesse, thanks so much. And Scapes Hip Hop and the White House premieres exclusively on Hulu April 22nd. And still to come, Baby Bliss meet the critically endangered orangutan whose birth gives hope to its species. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Here was a story. Where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Of course, the mystery of a missing woman, Anna Royal, doesn't get more fascinating than that. Then the moment that silenced everyone. It's been a really difficult time. I would argue that the royal family were already facing a crisis. This health crisis has given them probably their biggest challenge. The Crown in Crisis. What is the relationship like between Harry and William today? Now streaming on Hulu. This is not about parents who just let their kid watch violent movies, play violent video games. This is about parents who neglected their son, ignored his cries for help, and then bought him a gun. The first parents in America to be charged in a school shooting. They purchased that gun for him and bragged about it. You don't get to walk away from that. That's a criminal act. Sins of the parents, the crumbly trials. The opposite of love is not hate. It's just being ignored. Only on Hulu. What would you do? Uh, I was thinking I want to open up our marriage. If you heard a husband being asked to open up his marriage. I don't know if I feel comfortable that you've already, like, made decisions without me. Well, just wait until you see what our hidden cameras catch. I do not want another man in our marriage. Well, this is what I want. He is on his way. Wow. We got dinner and a show. And just wait till you see what happens when he walks in. Hell no. What would you do? Sunday night, all new on ABC. Welcome back. The birth of a critically endangered orangutan this week is delighting conservationists and zookeepers alike at Bush Gardens, Tampa Bay, and it will delight you too. Janae Norman has the adorable story. Oh, baby. A critically endangered Bornean orangutan born at Bush Gardens in Tampa Bay. And it's a girl. There's only a few thousand of them left in the world. And so every single time a new baby orangutan is born, we're very, very excited about it. Everyone going bananas over the adorable orangutan who's already winning hearts, seen here cuddling her stuffed animal. She was born April 13th via C-section to Mama Luna, weighing just three pounds, four ounces. During that ultrasound process, we discovered that unfortunately baby was in that breech position. And so we did that cesarean section that same day to make sure that we could ensure the health and safety of Luna and her baby. Now, both Luna and her baby getting stronger every day. And as the staff who care for the baby help her grow, they're also hard at work finding the perfect name for their little star. I'll let you in on a little secret that most of them have to do with celestial events. After all, mom's name is Luna, so that seems to fit. I didn't know that. Now we're in on the secret. Adorable. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com.
Good night. Church pastor is dead. Shot in the back with a 12 gauge shotgun. People were like, what? The preacher's wife? There had to be a good reason, some speculated, to pick up that shotgun and shoot her husband. Mary appeared to have had a marriage made in heaven, but behind closed doors, it was a living hell. All new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your